Hi, Alison. Hi, Sarah. You look chilly. <laughs> Freezing. <laughs> You're wearing your coat in the middle of uh, the studio. Yeah, it's uh, cold. It's cold in Paris. It, it's, it's cold. cold. It's, winter. And it's winter. And also, there's still concerns over energy. Yeah, prices. they've lowered the heat. They've yeah. lowered the heat, I think, here. They've yeah. definitely been encouraging people around France to lower mm. their heat. And yeah. uh, I think I'm feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently, it's working because yeah. the government says that now all the talk about, you know, uh, power cuts. Elect- it's power true. cuts, etc. Um, it, it's not going to happen because yeah. the French have been very good in lowering. Yeah, uh, I'm wearing their, my coat. I'm doing my yeah, job. You're I'm doing, doing my your job. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're doing. No, but I've got the polar neck. Yeah, on. there we go. Yeah, so, there we yeah. are. So we're being very good. <laughs> anyway, back to the serious business of what's <laughs> actually happening in France. The country's in the throes of strike action and it's getting serious. Mm. Turnout at last week's street protests against the government's pension reform was even bigger than anticipated. Yeah, yeah. Unions were hoping, what, for like a million people to come out? Mm -hmm. Already that was a high, you know hope. Yeah. An official figure said about 1.3 million people came out all over the country, Paris, other big cities, and also a lot of small cities around the country. So the focus of the anger is on the government's plan to raise the minimum age of retirement on a full pension from the current 62 to 64 years old. Yeah, the government says this needs to be done. The mm. system is running low on money. The majority of the French, though, don't agree, or at least they don't agree with the way it's being done now, this reform, and it's turned into a standoff. So the pension reform is already unpopular, but it could be even more so for women. Mm. Uh, an official report released this week uh, appears to show that women would come off worse in this reform. They'd have to work, on average, an extra seven months Compared to five more months for men, this is in order to reduce the pension imbalance between the sexes. A government minister really put the cat among the pigeons. He admitted that women would be slightly penalised by the increase in the retirement age. Mm. Yeah. Open talk, honest talk. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't always go down very well, no. though, does it? <laughs> Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne was furious, as you can imagine, uh, at the idea that she was somehow promoting an anti-woman reform. Uh. So she denied this. She said that women, who of course often work part-time or in low-paid work, would be the first to benefit from the planned increase in the lowest pension rate uh, to 1,200 euros a month. Right, because part of this reform would have sort of the minimum amount you could earn uh, on on your full pension. Yeah, at 67. Yeah, 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 yeah the, the, highest, the highest age. But anyway, there's lots of numbers being mm. thrown around in this debate. Uh, yeah, we have the feeling it's still very much a work in progress. For sure. Yeah, uh, the reform will be debated in the National Assembly at the start of February. So in the meantime, I went along to last week's demo to chat to to a few women, though uh, I have to say they were in the minority because with the teachers being on strike and everything, mm. many mums, uh, still the mums, still the mums, yeah, yeah, had to stay at home and mind the kids. <laughs> They've rolled out some new chants and banners for the pension reform protest, but Macron is still the main target. Your name is Macron, you look like an idiot. The French want you to step down. That's a rough translation of the recording coming out of one of the union's trucks to the tune of the famous Italian anti-fascist hymn. A small middle-aged woman with long straw-coloured hair wearing a white coat is holding a placard. It reads, 64-year-old nurses caring for 60-year-old residents in care homes. Thanks, Macron. Working until 64 in a care home, given the entry age for residents is 60, shows the situation won't be easy. Soon you won't be able to tell residents apart from care workers. The slogan came to me late one night. Sylvie Picard is a night bird, but it's no party for her. She's been working as a nurse in a Paris hospital on night shifts since 1994. And in the spring, she'll turn 60. When I started nursing, the retirement age for us was 57. You could retire then, even if it wasn't on a full pension. Then it went up to 62, and now it will be 64. We look after difficult patients, and we have to pick them up when they fall over. We carry three-litre bags of fluid, push beds around, and so on. My colleagues have had knee replacements at 56 years old. They're ill, exhausted. 
And doing this overnight is even more difficult than people think, she says. Night work is even more exhausting. And contrary to what people think, we don't sleep during our shifts. We carry on taking care of patients. How do they expect us to carry on until 64? Further away from the seething crowds in Place de la République, two women are laughing together and huddling against the cold. <laughs> My message is booksellers are not like wine. They don't improve with age. Bookseller Bulle Prévost is 27 and she's here with her colleague, 58-year-old Sophie Forneron. It is the first time I'm taking part in a protest for the retirement and pension in France because uh, this is not uh, fair, this is not uh, financially needed at the moment uh, and uh, I guess nobody wants it in this format anyway. For Néron says she'll probably have to work through till 65. She isn't desperate to retire, but then it isn't just about her. First of all, I'm not sure I will be impacted a lot, but I'm here not only for me. As a bookseller, I'm happy with my job, but I'm lucky to be happy. The problem is for unhappy people, it's for young ladies, And it's for young people starting working very early during their life. And what will be their future? I feel concerned because it concerns my future. Because I started working at 24. If we calculate it right, I should be working until 67 and um, carrying heavy uh, books all day. It won't be okay when I'm 60, 63, 65 and 67. I put it to the women that in many other EU countries, the minimum legal age of retirement is already a lot higher than in France. It's 65, 66, even 67 in countries like Germany, Italy and the UK. What we say in French language, uh, (laughs) comparaison is not raison. (laughs) Comparison is not reason. No, it's not because uh, uh, in other countries they have to work all their life. It's not what we want. And it's not uh, uh, necessary another way of life and way of working is possible. So German booksellers, British booksellers, uh, (laughs) follow us. We think that there are other ways of thinking how to pay our pensions in the future. It's time uh, to sit down and work together. The French population is getting older and older. Does that mean that in 10 years we will have to move from 67 to 70 and 10 years later to 80? So it's a nonsense. We are aware that this is an issue. But there is not only one solution. This reform is not only, not necessarily from a money viewpoint, but it's also unfair and it's not equal to women. There has been no discussion, no negotiation. And it is personally why also I am here on the street. The demo stops for a while and I find myself squashed up against a middle-aged woman in a bobble hat. We're both jogging on the spot to keep warm. Anne-Emmanuelle Rigaudier is a nursery nurse in Paris, taking care of babies and toddlers. She's not accustomed to demonstrating either and has lost a day's pay to come. This is the first time I've gone on strike for a day because it seemed important. We don't want to work till 64 or maybe even 67 to get a full pension. We work with young children and can't imagine that we'll be handling babies at 67. I'm not sure we'll even be standing up straight. I'm 55 and I think I'll have to work until 66 or 67 to get a full pension but I haven't looked into it fully. Oui. 
So she hasn't looked into this reform fully. I mean, I'm not sure that many people have looked into the, the details. Um, they're just furious, though, about raising this retirement age to 64. I mean, even if the details are still unclear. Mm. All of that will get hashed out in a couple of weeks, we hope, mm. when the bill, which is actually a social security spending bill, starts being debated in the National Assembly on February the 6th. The opposition, particularly the left and the Green Nupes Alliance, is going full on against this reform. They say it's unnecessary, it's unfair, and they're really pulling out all the stops to keep it from passing. They just want to stop it in its tracks. Yeah, and remember, Macron's party doesn't have a parliamentary majority, mm -hmm. so it needs uh, the vote of certain Republican conservatives yeah. uh, to get the bill passed. Yeah, yeah, and even some members of the government's party are saying this reform, mm. as it's been presented by the government, needs to change. Barbara Pompili is one of them. She's an MP um, with the majority. She's a former environment minister. She said that she cannot vote on the bill as it's currently written. Speaking to RFI, she said that she and others have offered amendments to make it fairer. We will have to find ways of compensating for the injustices caused by pushing back the age of retirement. Obviously, I wouldn't be unhappy if we backpedaled on raising the age, but the president made that promise. It's clearly important to the government for financial reasons, which you can understand. So I am trying to find other solutions. We have proposed amendments that I'm hoping will improve the bill. That's how it works. The bill, as it stands, does not seem to me to be balanced enough to get passed. So we're making proposals, having discussions. That's parlementary debate. So she also made the point that such a reform that impacts really everyone can't just be pushed through in the face of so much public mm. opposition. So we've got pushback there, even within the majority, where there's clearly not a consensus on even raising the retirement age, even if, as we heard her say, she'll actually back it when it comes down to voting. Of course, while the 64-year-old mark is what is infuriating many opponents, not everyone minds the idea of working until then. I spoke with a woman, full disclosure, she's a family friend, Marie-Christine, who ran the training department for a large multinational company and had just started a big new project when her company pushed her into retirement at age 62. We were looking towards the future. We weren't talking about retirement. Then suddenly management announced they wanted to cut staff. They said very directly, Marie-Christine, you're the right age, you started working young, so you've contributed enough. You'll get a good pension, so you're the first in line to go. We'll get rid of your job post. My first thought was, what on earth will happen to my project? They said... We'll manage, don't you worry. I asked if I could continue working only on the project and part-time. They said no, and since you're not going willingly, we'll cut a deal. <laughs> she negotiated a good package. I mean, she did well for herself. But she was a bit at a loss before retirement was this abstract idea. I mean, she imagined it several years down the line when she'd get tired of working or feel less useful. Instead, she found herself at 62, financially doing fine, but not sure what to do with the rest of her life. You're really young at 62. It's ridiculous to say you're too old and you need to stop. I know there are some jobs. When I worked in factories, I saw people who were very tired and could easily have left at 50. But when you're a manager and you enjoy what you do and you're still sharp, I don't see why you wouldn't continue. So she looked around at the world of associations. France has a lot of associations. And for the last 12 years, she's been very active working with different organizations first with kids, and now she runs a branch of an association that connects volunteers with groups that need help. She says that now she has few regrets about being pushed to retire before she was ready. She found a freedom that she didn't even realize she wanted. I discovered the joy of no longer having an alarm clock or a watch. Doing things at my own pace, I decided to work with associations that were less than a 15-minute walk from my house, so no more traffic jams. I gave my car to my kids. I felt free. I wasn't particularly looking for that freedom, but I thought, why not make the most of it? One of the issues that comes up, Sarah, when we talk about raising the retirement age is employing so-called seniors, because... What's the point pushing back the age of retirement if people are not 
employed. Yeah, and senior is considered anyone over the age of 55. Yeah, hands up, this is me. <laughs> France is notoriously bad about hiring or keeping people employed after then. Mm. Hervé Bouloul, who's in charge of retirement issues at the OECD, the Paris-based International Economic Organization that gives economic policy advice to governments, he says that France's reform is, first and foremost, about balancing a deficit, one that's not immediate, but that over the the next decade will mean the pension system will be 15 to 20 billion euros in the red. Not insignificant. But he also told me that it, some part of this reform is also about keeping senior workers employed longer. The main objective of the reform is to try to restore financial balance. But the employment rate of France uh, after age 60 is low in international comparison. And that's also maybe one of the objectives of the reform and something that is very important to which I think is central in the debate, is that one of the huge accomplishments of the uh, French economy over the last 20 years is that the employment rate of the 55-59 was 20 years ago below 50%. Now it's close to 75% and it is now even above the OECD average. What has France done to, to improve that rate? Well, there were many, many factors. There were the 2010 reform to uh, increase the retirement age from 60 to 62. There were the increase in the contribution period to get your full pension. But also, of course, beyond pensions, there is also the fact that there were more female employment. And also, people are in better health and people are better educated than past generations. So there is a mix of factors. But what is important for today is that when we look at 6064, there has also been an increase. 20 years ago, the employment rate of 6064 in France was 10%. It has increased to now close to 33, 35%. So that's a big increase with an acceleration, by the way, after 2011, potentially related, of course, to the previous pension reforms. But although it has increased, it is still about 20 points below the OECD average. What's the problem in France? Is companies don't want to hire them or is it a French elderly people don't want to work? There are many factors, but for the uh, related to the discussion, pension rules play a key role. Yes, there is age 62, but beyond that, we also have possibilities if you started early your career, which is fair in some aspects, uh, to retire at age 60. And there is also all the special regimes. Although we talk in this reform of 62 as the reference minimum age currently, note that about 30% of people get their pensions at age 61. If with the current minimum retirement age at 62, 30% of people are retiring at 61, what would you expect then a, a raise in the minimum retirement age to 64 do? Would we basically see people retiring at 62? Or would that sort of jumpstart a whole hiring and, and keeping on of elderly you know, employees and people would actually work till 64? Do we really have no idea? This is a difficult question to estimate precisely. But what we've seen is that, of course, if you increase the retirement age, this tends to have a significant impact on uh, the age when people take their pension. This doesn't mean that all people keep their employment. Yes, indeed, there are some people that struggle. But what we can say based on past experiences is that the unemployment rate of older people does not increase. France has this sort of general approach to work as you work, you pay your taxes, and then at some point you get to retire to enjoy life. The idea being like that, that comes afterwards. And this sort of, I almost want to say like, an, it's a little bit of an exceptional sort of system that we've built, where people are expecting to be able to have a sort of long-ish time after finishing work, where they can do things or enjoy their retirement. And it seems as though reforms that raise the age of retirement sort of chip away at this image that people have of their lives and how they will move forward. What would you say to that? Yes, people aspire in France to retire if they have good pensions as early as possible. But this is the case in many countries. It's, of course, debatable whether it's even good for them. 
but this is often what what we see uh, and sometimes there are good reasons, of course, health, difficult health conditions, difficult working conditions, but also sometimes people tend to underestimate their remaining life years. It, it strikes me, though, that all people see are these age numbers, 62, 64. How am I supposed to work? How have you seen other countries deal with it on a sort of political economic level? Well, two things. First, uh, as often highlighted, it comes back often uh, to have discussions about reforming pensions in France and in part because the system is very complex. So then you try to solve one point, but you don't you cannot solve the whole system because it is quite fragmented. But but pensions is an area where reforms did take place over the last three decades in France. There have been huge reform, in fact, that have had an impact on, on the sustainability of the pension system. But you're right that increasing the retirement age is typically difficult politically and it's unpopular in many countries. And if you ask people uh, what should be the age when they are allowed to retire, well, people, uh, it's normal, I think everyone almost uh, would like to have that flexibility. But the way to ask the question is, if you don't do that, then what else? What else can we do, he asks. The opposition says, tax the rich. Yeah, um, it's an easy thing to say and tempting, right? Because mm. of all of the, the the massive profits that companies recently have made, energy companies, there have been you know, lots of talk about redistributing that here in France. But um, when you're looking at a pension system that was created and, and based on basically a system of active workers paying to cover the pensions of current retired workers, it really would mean a fundamental shift in how the system works and how it's financed. Maybe that is what's needed. Mm, because what was conceived in the beginning as a, as a fair system and therefore accepted by the majority is no longer seen in that way. Yeah, yeah. But for now, um, we are dealing with this current reform and opposition is also harnessing a, a broader anger against Macron and the government, also frustration at inflation and rising costs of living. Another massive strike and protest is planned for next week on January the 31st. So talking of protests, the biggest, of course, in recent history in France remains May 1968. Yeah, weeks of civil unrest, general strikes to try to bring down the de Gaulle government. It didn't work, of mm. course, but while students were throwing paving stones at police behind barricades at the Sorbonne University in Paris, on the other side of town, delegations from the US and Vietnam were holding secret meetings. Ah. Yeah, this was to try and reach an agreement to end the nearly two decade long Vietnam War. Something completely different. Yeah, mm. absolutely. They were called the Paris Peace Accords and they took nearly five years to negotiate. They were, in fact, the longest diplomatic discussions in history. They were finally signed between the US and South Vietnam on the one hand and the communist North Vietnam and the Viet Cong. That was the name given to communists in the South. And it happened on the 27th of January 1973, so 50 years ago this week. Just a few days before that, then US President Richard Nixon announced the agreement in a statement broadcast simultaneously in Washington and Hanoi. At 12.30 Paris time today, January 23, 1973, the agreement on ending the war and restoring peace in Vietnam was initialed by Dr. Henry Kissinger on behalf of the United States and Special Advisor Lee Duc Tho on behalf of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. The accords marked the pullout of U.S. troops from Vietnam. And the war, even though the U.S. didn't call it a war, mm -hmm. had become, as you know, Sarah, extremely unpopular with huge protests in the states, especially in the late 60s. So, so these peace accords were being negotiated in Paris. Why here? Well, it's partly about... Uh, France's long shared history with Vietnam. Vietnam had been part of France's colony in Indochina since the late 19th century. But by the end of World War II, France was facing an increasingly powerful independence movement known as the Viet Minh, led by uh, the communist Ho Chi Minh. They took over the northern city of Hanoi and in 1945, at the end of World War II, declared a democratic republic of Vietnam. 
France uh, didn't let this go unchallenged. No, it wasn't mm. keen to let go of this, you know, territory in Asia. Uh, they went to war against the Viet Minh. This is known as the French Indochina War. It lasted eight years and ended in humiliating defeat for France in May 1954 with the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. That brought to an end nearly a century of colonial rule. France signed a treaty with the Viet Minh, splitting Vietnam in two along what's known as the 17th parallel. The communist Viet Minh controlled the north and the anti-communists who had supported the French controlled the south. That split didn't work and it basically kicked off a civil war in Vietnam in the same year. So did France get involved then? They certainly did not. They huh. wanted no part in this new conflict. And General de Gaulle warned the US not to get involved, even though they were supporting the anti-communist South behind the scenes. I predict you will sink step by step into a bottomless military and political quagmire, de Gaulle told US President John F. Kennedy in 1961. Oof, I guess that after Jan Bien Phu, de Gaulle knew what he was talking about. Yeah, and in 1966, when things were getting much heavier after the US committed troops to Vietnam, uh, it got further into the swamp, the French president gave a speech in the Cambodian capital, Phnom Penh, urging the US to pull out. Eh bien, la France considère que les combats qui ravagent l'Indochine n'apportent par eux-mêmes et eux non plus aucune issue. France considers that the fighting that's ravaging Indochina has no exit, de Gaulle said. While it's unlikely the American war machine will be destroyed in the field, it is impossible that the people of Asia submit to the law of foreign power coming from the other side of the Pacific, whatever its intentions and the strength of its weapons. France is sure that there will be no military solution, he said. And, well, he was kind of right there, mm. and the U.S. didn't really heed the warning. After a while, it did become clear that the U.S. had to find a way to get out. Um, and in choosing where to negotiate, I guess France made sense because of its historical ties to Vietnam, didn't get involved in the war, so kind of seemed more neutral. Yeah, I think I think that's partly the case. And then, of course, there was the language. It's so important, isn't mm. it? French had been the language of administration in Vietnam for nearly a century, so educated people spoke it. So that made France seem like a sensible location for these peace talks. Then there was the fact that there was a significant Vietnamese community here able to offer support to the delegations. Also, the French Communist Party provided a lot of logistical support. It was very strong at the time and keen to see U.S. troops pull out of Vietnam. The South Vietnamese delegation was housed in verrières le buisson south of Paris, and the North Vietnam delegation, 13 kilometers away, in Choisy-le-Roi, also south of Paris. Mm, so I imagine these peace accords were welcome to some extent in France. Yeah, well, the Communist Daily L'Humanité wrote, it is an immense victory for Vietnam, which having got French colonialism to kneel down, has defeated American imperialism. Mm. But as we know, this accord of 1973 did not actually end the war. No, although U.S. diplomat Henry Kissinger and the Vietnamese politician Le Duc Thu were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 73 for their efforts, the ceasefire between North and South Vietnam fell apart. And it wasn't until April 1975 that the Vietnam War ended when communist troops from North Vietnam entered Saigon in triumph. Vietnam was reunified under communist rule and the Socialist Republic of Vietnam was officially proclaimed in 1976. We've come to the end of the show. Spotlight on France is a production of Radio France International. This episode was mixed by Cécile Pompiani. If you have questions or comments, get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. You can send an email, spotlight.france at rfi.fr, or look for us on Instagram, Spotlight on France. And you can get previous episodes at rfienglish.com or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back in two weeks' time on Thursday, February the 9th. Bye, Sarah. Bye, Alison. Bye, Sarah.